Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here. Hope you've all been doing well. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at Samsung's flagship smartphone from 2017, the Samsung Galaxy S8 Plus. It's not often that I look at smartphones on the channel, whereas most of my content and focus is on PC hardware. But every once in a while, I like to share my thoughts on cool tech products and gadgets that I use in my daily life. I picked up the S8 Plus in the second quarter of 2018, and for quite the bargain if I may add. So, when you can find a device like this now with such hefty discounts, it makes it all the more enticing regardless of being almost 2 years old at this point. I'll be honest though, I don't really pay too much attention to the smartphone market because I only utilize my phone in a pretty basic way. I'll talk more about that later in this review, but let's take a look at the device itself, shall we? Now when Samsung released the Galaxy S8 Plus back in 2017, they caught the attention of a lot of consumers in the smartphone market. This was because they were one of the first smartphone manufacturers to set the trend for really pushing that screen to body ratio appearance. You guys remember how back in the day people would post leaked images of highly anticipated devices and it would only have full bezel-less screens on the front? Yeah, well, Samsung actually made that a thing. This was a huge step forward and a welcoming change from the traditional iPhone-like look with a fat chin and a home button design. And that's probably why the phone still looks attractive even near the end of 2018 and will probably continue to look attractive for the coming year, as other devices from different manufacturers have been replicating their own style of giving that all-screen body effect with the inclusion of notches to motorized front-facing cameras and so on. Since we're on the topic of the screen, the Galaxy S8 Plus is rocking a gorgeous 6.2-inch edge-to-edge infinity display which is slightly curved on the sides to give it that nice, sleek, and attractive finish. The back of the phone is also made from glass, which is aesthetically pleasing, but is concerning when taking into account durability. The screen has an 185 by 9 aspect ratio with a wide quad HD resolution of 2960 by 1440 which at this size allows for a density of 529 pixels per inch. Although do keep in mind, for some reason out of the box, Samsung defaults the display to a lower resolution. I don't know why they would decide to do this because at first I, I thought it was for battery ma life management, but I found there was hardly a difference at all in terms of power consumption with the display maxed out. This gives you a very nice, sharp, and crisp looking display, and facilitating great image quality is the Super AMOLED display Samsung uses, which provides you with fantastic colors, vibrant images, good viewing angles, and great contrast with deep blacks. It's just a very high quality display that really makes the experience and usability of the phone a lot more enjoyable for whatever apps you might be using. The screen is protected by Corning Gorilla Glass 5, so you don't have to worry about putting the phone in your pocket and getting it scratched from keys or coins. With approximately 84% screen to body ratio, a minimized chin and a thin sensor bar with a front facing camera, this gives you a lot of screen estate. You can have more content displayed, which is very useful for when you're scrolling through a long forum thread or reading an article on a web page. It just gives you a lot more headroom to work with, and I'm sure many will appreciate that. Let's move on to the rest of the specifications, and do keep in mind, the version of the Galaxy S8 Plus that I have is the North American version, more specifically the Canadian G955W model. So depending on where you are in the world, some specs and software features might be different. So the CPU that this model is using comes from Qualcomm, the Snapdragon 835 based on Samsung's 10 nanometer LPE process. It's an octa-core processor which runs four of its Cairo cores at 2.36 GHz and the remaining four at 1.9 GHz. The integrated Adreno 540 GPU is also quite fast, being able to boost itself to 670 MHz. It has 4 GB of LPDDR4 memory, which by today's standards seems like mid-range now since newer flagship devices have up to 8 GB of RAM, but trust me, it's still sufficient. For the onboard storage capacity, you're going to get 64GB which is expandable through the micro SD card slot and has support for up to 256GB which is excellent. It's convenient because I've seen the prices of micro SD cards fall over the last couple of months. I've seen 128GB SD cards drop to just $20 
which is awesome. You really don't have to be concerned about storage management. The S8 Plus comes with a 3500mAh battery, the front of the phone has an 8 megapixel camera with an f1.7 aperture, and the rear of the phone has a dual 12 megapixel camera with the same f1.7 aperture which supports recording up to 4K at 30 frames per second. Besides the rear camera, you'll find the LED flash and a heart rate sensor, and the opposite side you have the fingerprint scanner. Not the greatest choice in terms of placement because I've placed my finger over the camera by mistake, ended up smudging it, and with a bulkier case on, it can be kind of awkward to reach, but at least they did rectify that decision with the S9. Moving on to connectivity, the S8 Plus supports 4G LTE, Wi-Fi support includes dual band 802.11 AC, Bluetooth 5.0, and NFC. It uses a USB Type-C port for data transfer and charging, which by the way supports Qualcomm's Quick Charge 2.0 technology. It also supports wireless charging, which is great because I know a lot of people like to come home and toss their devices onto a charging pad, or I've seen a lot of modern cars come with integrated wireless charging pads. On the left side of the charging port, we have a 3.5mm headphone jack, which unfortunately has become a rare thing these days, even for a flagship phone that costs well over $1,000. Perhaps seeing the omission of such basic features and Charging extra for things like dongles has left a bitter taste in my mouth in regards to the smartphone market and why I choose not to really keep up with new flagships these days. But I digress. On the other side, we have a speaker which gets loud enough and does the job. It doesn't provide any stereo listening type of experience, but it's good enough and I feel like most people would be opting to use headphones anyways. Adding to that spec sheet is the fact that the S8 Plus is IP68 water, dust, dirt, and sand resistant and the device can be submerged to a maximum depth of 1.5 meters underwater for up to 30 minutes. So on paper, the Galaxy S8 Plus is still quite impressive even for today's standards. It is loaded with a ton of features that like I mentioned earlier, flagships released a couple months ago don't even have. For the majority of users, these specs are more than enough to do what the average person will be using their smartphone for and keep them relevant for a very long time. But while that's all fine and good, Let's jump into the software side of things and see what the user experience is actually like. Now you guys may have seen some reviews of the smartphone back when it was released in 2017. And back then, the device was released with Android Nougat and I believe they were using an older version of the Samsung experience. But since then, Samsung has pushed out the Android Oreo update in 2018 with Samsung Experience version 9.0 running on top of it. It's just 8.0, not 8.1 unfortunately, while Samsung hasn't officially given out any information regarding Android Pie for the S8 Plus, there have been some rumors circulating around lately that after the S9 lineup has been updated, the S8 lineup should follow shortly after, but take that with a grain of salt for now. Going back to what's currently on my S8 Plus with Android 8.0 and Samsung Experience 9.0, so far since I bought the phone back in April 2018, the experience has been pretty solid. People are quick to negatively harp on TouchWiz and make statements such that it pales in comparison to stock Android because it's too bloated, it makes the phone lag, or it's unnecessarily using too many system resources, and I can kind of understand where they are coming from because this is the reputation Samsung has built with their TouchWiz skin. And believe me when I say that because I used to have a Galaxy S2 back in 2011. I have been through the TouchWiz hell and it was an absolute nightmare. So when I had switched over to my OnePlus One in 2014 with CyanogenMod, which was pretty much stock Android, I felt so relieved and I thought I could never be able to go back to that Samsung experience ever again. And I want you guys to know that I am retracting what I said because Samsung has come a long way since then. TouchWiz is now completely acceptable in my opinion. I haven't noticed any sort of lag in my usage of the device from swiping, opening, and switching apps. It's all been quite snappy. I won't say it feels bloated either, as you don't have a bunch of Samsung apps in your face all the time. Although Samsung's Bixby Assistant is still there, and I don't recommend it over the Google Assistant. Thankfully though, you can disable it, but unfortunately that's all you can pretty much do as the dedicated Bixby button can't be used as a shortcut for anything else, which does suck. Aside from that, by default in the apps tray, there is a dedicated Samsung app folder, and I hardly actually ever find myself interacting with it. But going back to things I like about the software, there's a lot that this phone has to offer which makes the user experience fantastic. 
The edge screen that you can use from just swiping from the right side of the phone is very convenient. You can use it to access a bunch of shortcuts to quickly launch an app, bring up frequently contacted contacts lists, check scores from your favorite major league sports teams, help optimize phone performance, check reminders, and even have access to tools like taking a screenshot of a certain portion or capture a GIF. The secure folder is great for those individuals who may have a lot of sensitive and private information they want to keep hidden from others, which can even include apps themselves. Being Android, you can customize your home pages in any way you like, such as setting up folders with various types of apps, widgets, and customize the layout of the pages, as well as to suit your preferences. The themes, wallpapers, and icon packs can be accessed from the menu as well. I've been using the default ones as they just look fine to me, but it's good to know you have the option available for customizability. I really like how I can quickly use the recent app button to quickly go through a list of apps I've used to jump between different apps, clear them if I don't need them anymore, and also use the multi-window button to choose which two apps I want to use simultaneously at the same time by splitting the screen up. I use this feature a lot for when I'm watching a video on YouTube for example, and at the same time being able to read an article for example from somewhere else. Or you could also just use two different messaging apps at the same time. It allows you to multitask in different ways, and it's also good that the windows are adjustable instead of evenly just splitting the two apart. For those of you who like different security and locking features, Samsung has got you covered. You can use the traditional pin, pattern, or passphrase setup. You can also use the fingerprint scanner at the rear of the phone, however as mentioned earlier some may find that inconvenient due to the placement of it. Adding to the suite of security locking features though, you can use the front facing camera to set up facial recognition, or use the infrared scanner to scan your iris. I personally found that the iris scanner to be the best one as it's fast, super responsive and is more secure than the facial recognition unlocking method. And what's helpful to the user is the fact that you can use these different methods at the same time. So if you just want to quickly glance at your phone to unlock it, you can do that, but you may find yourself in an area that doesn't have adequate lighting condition, so you can simply enter your pin instead. One of the gripes I originally had before transitioning to a phone with no dedicated home button or overflow and multitasking buttons was that I'd have to get used to using the on-screen buttons. However, that actually ended up working out a lot better than expected as different apps can allow you to fully max out the screen space and hide the buttons, but what's also cool is that you can arrange the buttons in any order that suits your needs or to a config that you might have gotten used to on a previous device. Samsung also came in clutch with the pressure sensitive home button. It's not really a physical home button, just simulated, but it would be hard to tell them apart, since they've done a good job implementing it. Being able to quickly go back home anytime regardless of whatever you were doing is useful. Let's go back to talking about the screen. More specifically, I wanted to share my experience when it came to watching videos such as on YouTube. YouTube is one of those video streaming apps that can take advantage of the S8 Plus's gorgeous ultra-wide display. Being able to watch videos at a resolution of 1440p on a screen this size results in a very detailed and sharp image quality. You also get the option to max out the videos to match the size of the display even if, even if they aren't natively rendered at the ultra-wide format. For some videos, this looks great, but for some, it can crop out portions of the video that might have some important information on them. However, if you do get the chance to view some ultra-wide content, it does look absolutely stellar. Moving on, I wanted to talk about the camera and camera app of the phone. Samsung usually does a good job implementing a high-quality camera with their devices, and their app is one of the best out there. The settings menu will give you a lot of options to play around with. You can choose the picture size going all the way up to 12 megapixels. As for video recording, you can record at 1440p at 30 frames per second, or even 4K at 30 frames per second. And they also include the option to record at 1080p 60fps, which is the video recording option that I actually find myself using more often than not, as it's a good compromise between visual quality and fluidity. And then you've got more options for things like setting timers, video stabilization, location tags, and even being allowed to use voice control. For example, saying cheese to take a picture. When you have the camera app open, swiping from the left of the screen will bring up a submenu showing different shooting modes from auto, pro, panorama, slow motion, and even a food option. The pro option is great as it allows you to adjust things like exposure, image tone, ISO, and adapt the camera to different lighting conditions, and more. Overall, it's a very sophisticated but user-friendly camera app that will get the job done for most people. But here are some shots so you guys can judge for yourselves.
Now this wouldn't be a hardware review if there weren't some benchmarks to show. So up first we have Antutu benchmarks, which gave us an overall score of 199,889, with a further breakdown of separate scores. With the CPU scoring 69,239, the GPU 79,196, UX at 44,227, and the memory at 7,227. Up next, we have Geekbench 4, and this benchmark yields a single core score of 1806, and a multi-core score of 6,333. PCMark's Work 2.0 benchmark makes this device run through a series of tests from web browsing to video editing tasks, and with this specific benchmark, the SA Plus scores 6133. Passmark for Android is another benchmark that makes this device go through a series of tests from integer, floating point, 3DFX, memory read, write, tests, and more. So after those tests were completed, this benchmark gave us a system score of 13,296. And finally, we had 3DMark Slingshot Extreme, a graphics-based benchmark, that can give you guys an outlook on the phone's 3D performance and gaming performance. Here the S8 Plus scores an impressive 3507 in OpenGL mode and 2704 in Vulkan mode. Since the benchmarks are out of the way now, I want to elaborate on what I said at the start of the video when I mentioned I only use my phone in a basic way. While I consider myself an avid gamer who plays a lot of games at high frame rates, ultra settings on their PC, and enjoys their Nintendo Switch on the side, I absolutely do not play any games on my S8 Plus. I just don't find mobile games enjoyable. Sure, they might be okay as time passers, but I've just hated the fact how they put microtransactions and ads in your face after every other click, so I've just never really bothered with them. Honestly, my needs on my smartphone consist of calling, messaging, browsing the web, emailing, browsing some social media websites, streaming music, and watching videos on it. That's it. I don't do any sort of video editing on my phone, nor do I take any sort of studio quality photos. So for my needs, the S8 Plus is plenty for what I needed to do. The device that I was previously using before was the original OnePlus One. I would have actually liked to keep that device for longer, however the charge port started giving me issues and the battery life was just awful and I couldn't find a reliable source for a good battery replacement. Speaking of battery life, I found the S8 Plus's 3500mAh battery to be adequate for my needs. Go figure. By doing a mix of all the tasks and activities I mentioned before during the day, I actually found that I'll still have about 15-30% to battery life left depending on how intensely I used it that day. And I actually don't even charge my phone overnight. Keep in mind, I actually also keep my Bluetooth and my location setting on high accuracy pretty much on all the time as I'm using my phone to pair with my smartwatch, the Fossil Q Gen 3, and I also like to use my hands-free capability for my car, and I also like to use Android Auto. I'll charge it in the morning as I'm getting ready for work and eating breakfast, and thanks to its fast charging capability, I can find a day's worth of charge ready to go as I'm heading out the door. Putting this all together, when I was able to find such a sweet deal on the Galaxy S8 Plus, 400 Canadian dollars for a flagship from last year, I jumped on it, with newer models out from Samsung and with the S10 that will possibly launch in Q1 of next year, you can probably expect more hefty discounts on the S8 and S8 Plus. While it may not be the latest flagship and is almost nearing 2 years old at this point, I'll reiterate it again, it's going to offer you great bang for your buck since it will be able to do majority of the tasks that your average consumer needs their smartphone for. Buying an older flagship as opposed to purchasing a newer mid-range smartphone in the $400 to $500 Canadian dollar range, in my opinion, is the better way to go because something newer at this price point would actually have inferior specs. It's funny because before I found the deal on the S8 Plus, I was absolutely baffled by the choices I had in this segment because in many ways, if I was to go with one of those mid-range budget phones, I'd be downgrading from my OnePlus One, a smartphone that was released back in 2014. You might be asking, well, why didn't you just buy a OnePlus 6 then? Unfortunately, due to our dollar dropping and OnePlus gradually increasing their prices, they're in that flagship territory. They are not that flagship killer company they once were. Plus, you'd have to go through the worry of whether you'll get software updates, Will it get security patches, and if there is a big bug, will the devs fix it? At a lower price point, you're just getting so much more for your money, and at the end of the day, that's what matters to me. So with that said, this wraps up my late, but also long-term review of the Galaxy S8 Plus. 
It's a great smartphone that's still an excellent pickup and will remain very viable for 2019. I hope you guys found this review to be informative and helpful. Let me know your thoughts, comments, and questions down below. Check out the video description for my other videos and ways to support the channel. And if you're interested in more content like this, then make sure you're subscribed. Thanks for watching, take care, and I'll see you in the next one.